some Baton Rouge whiskey here before. Would that be? We have, but you can't really assume that people okay. know. Uh, no, the reason I'm asking is because I want to say a little about what it's for, but that's not really, unfortunately, the point of the talk. Um, so it's a method for handling symmetries when you quantize. That was the original idea. And, um, and what's very important in it, it sits in the formalism of uh, derived uh, geometry and in some sense it's the embryonic form of derived stacks. So embryonic derived stacks. Now what are stacks about? Stacks are about symmetries in geometry. So you have, uh, for example, a gauge group acting. So the stack part corresponds to gauge, gauge groups and more generally uh, groupoids. And the derived part this corresponds to the idea that you have a locus inside some manifold which is of interest and instead of throwing away the rest of the manifold you somehow resolve the ideal uh, which cuts the locus out. So, uh, so this is resolution of the vanishing So which locus are we going to discuss? The Euler-Lagrange locus. So we're in a situation where we have a variational problem, and we consider the Euler-Lagrange equations. So let me call the action S, and then we, so roughly speaking, the Euler Lagrange locus is where uh, S has vanishing differential. And we're going to think of this as lying in some, inside some field space. So I'm going to actually have a very simple model. Let me write out an action. fairly formal, so I'm not going to quite say what I'm integrating over, but it will be, at least it will be one dimensional. So it might really be a formal one dimensional line, but um, anyway, uh, think of this as integrated over the line, and x is a map from R to, to some Euclidean space. So I'm thinking of a particle parameterized by this uh, x. So its trajectory is this function. And then p goes to the, the dual. So I guess we could think of it as being taking values in the cotangent bundle above. And it's a sort of Lagrange multiplier. So when you calculate the Euler-Lagrange equations, we get those two equations. And then that way, we get classical mechanics. The Momentum is conserved, that's this Euler Lagrange equation, and then the velocity equals the momentum. I've set the mass to one. Okay? 
So everything I talk about today will be an elaboration of this example. Um, the first, there are two directions I have to go in. One is I want to make this um, super symmetric. That's the spinning particle. So uh, roughly speaking, the quantization of this is the Laplacian on Rd. And the quantization that I'm going to have for the uh, spinning particle will be the square of the Dirac operator. And the supersymmetry of the model will correspond to the fact that there is something called the Dirac operator, which is the square root of, the, of this Laplacian. So, um, quantization is the Laplacian. Now, so now we have this, this was the particle. <coughs> Spinning particle. Well, now I'm going to have another field, theta. And uh, this is going to, again, R to Rd, but this field will be fermionic. Those two fields were bosonic, that is, functions of the field were commuting uh, uh, in you know, the, the all the partial derivatives of these functions are all understood to commute with each other. Whereas here, they're all understood to anti-commute each other and commute with those guys. So, the new action is like so. And it turns out, uh, and I should tell you the well in the equation. So, in this variable, essentially, when you solve it, it's constant. And when you quantize this, this field, you get the Clifford algebra. And in that way, you produce the spinners as the, um, uh, somehow, the Hilbert space. Yeah. I mean, what I, sorry, what I meant is the, the, the quantization of the algebra generated by theta is the Clifford algebra, and it acts on the Hilbert space, which is the spinners on R. Okay. So, so what Batalin and Wilkowski do is they say, say, could we say another word or two about why spinning is the same as super? Oh, I have no idea why they call it that. Do you mean, do you want me to justify the name spinning? I can't. It's actually a bit surprising because to me spinning for us, spinning is related to symmetries of Poincaré group. If we look at certain representations of Poincaré group, and this is how we get it. Uh, I don't get super symmetry like this. Oh, you do get symmetry. It's something special. Yeah, well, that's, that's what, that, that's that, what surprised me. I mean, we, definitely have supersymmetry. But um, the supersymmetry... Uh, no, it's clearly supersymmetric because you have taken an odd field. The question is, how do you interpret that oh, odd field as no, coming I'm, from a spinning sorry, symmetry? No, what I meant to say is it's supersymmetric because I can write down a transformation which generate. But I'm, I'm going to do it, I'm going to show you when we make there'll be a local supersymmetry when I add some more fields. So let me, I don't want to discuss rigid supersymmetry. Does this model anything real? I'm sorry? Does it model anything real? I'm sorry, uh, the Dirac operator. So or which it represents, yeah, I mean electron. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a pair, it's an electron together with some other, you know, uh, 
scalar particle. It's a pair. It's weird. Uh, I don't know. I guess, it, no, it's a whole spinner. Uh, what is it, actually? No, maybe it just, oh, oh dear. No, it's just a Dirac. It's just a spinner, just an electron. That doesn't make sense. Maybe when you show us the symmetries, we can. I, I mean, what I said was correct. The quantization of this is the square of the Dirac operator, somehow. But um, I want to. Dirac operator. I, I want to. I want to do quantum mechanics. I want to focus on the classical mechanics today. So, um, so I, I want to talk about the BB method. They introduce a differential so that there's some new field whose differential is this Euler-Lagrange equation, another one whose differential is this Euler-Lagrange equation, and another that gives this one. And of course, those new fields, they form a sort of causal complex. That I bet you've heard about here in all places. So, So we had fields xp and theta, and now we're going to have new fields, x, p, x plus p plus and theta plus. These are the anti-fields. Now what does this mean? The fields have ghost number zero, or if you just are a mathematician, um, degree zero, and the antifields have degree negative one. So when we form polynomials in the antifields, the degree will just be the homogeneity in antifields. So everything is in negative degree for now. And um, the reason we call them antifields is Vatala and Vilkovsky introduced a symplectic form. Now, I just want to warn you that what I'm writing here is not really correct because um, it would be correct if this was a f just a finite dimensional manifold, but this is rather, we're going to be looking at functions on jet spaces. This is variational calculus, so you have to modify, strictly speaking, what you mean by a symplectic form. But, but at least if you look in their papers, this is what they write. And the idea is roughly that these fields are canonically conjugate to each other with respect to some new kind of bracket which they denote like that, and it's called the anti-bracket. It's just the Poisson bracket for this symplectic structure. So it has ghost number plus one. That is, the ghost number of F anti-bracket G is the sum of their ghost numbers plus one. So what we're going to do is look for a solution of this equation. So it, um, yeah, and then define S of F to be capital S anti-bracket little f. And you see this raises degree by one, and it's a vector field, roughly speaking. So it's, a, it's, a, it's in fact a differential. If we, so actually, these two functions already satisfy uh, this equation extremely trivially because they don't even have any anti-fields in them. So they're identic, their anti-bracket with themselves is identically zero. And if you now take this differential in that case, you get the causal differential. So what you get in that case is S of x plus equals minus the derivative of P. S of P plus is the derivative of x minus P. And S of theta plus is the derivative of theta. 
So that's just the ordinary BV construction in this, in this simple setting. So now I want to study the following problem, which is modeled on uh, things which were done in string and superstring theory. Namely, to couple to a background gravitational field, or supergravity, uh, in fact, in this case. So I want, and if you like, to restore general covariance. This is the motivation. You want this model to be manifestly invariant under a reparameterization of the real line. Because why, why should one particular one-dimensional manifold be better than any other? for constructing this theory. That's the, somehow the logic. And the, it's clear that there's a problem with this action because you need something in order to replace R by a more general um, one-dimensional manifold. <coughs> we call it N. So one-dimensional oriented manifold. I need naturally to have a one form on N to integrate. Now the first term here is naturally a one form. It's P times the Durand differential of, of X. But the second term is not. It's a scalar on N times, times DT. What's DT? So we need to replace DT by some one form. And what we do is we introduce a new field which is going to be a frame of the cotangent bundle of N, a real line bundle. And that new field is called E. And it's a one form. So it's the frame. It's a, sorry, it is a frame. And it can be identified with the graviton field. One of the standard ways of um, understanding uh, gravitation is to use Cartan's moving frame. And this is a moving frame in one dimension, and that's the graviton. And it's a boson. So, Maybe if I I'll continue to write things on R, just for, I may as well choose a coordinate so I don't go completely insane. And then I'll, so I'll actually it'll be EDT, which is a one form, once I've chosen a coordinate. And so this is the, the complete action for the particle now. And I found, it, this, is, this was introduced around 1970. Six. And I found a remark, maybe it was actually in the later paper, that E here is somehow playing a role of a Lagrange multiplier. If you look at it, it the action in this form, you could say E is putting P on the light curve, assuming that the inner product and the target is because So that's one perspective, a graviton or Lagrange multiplier. trivial cocycle now in ghost number negative one for this differential. Can anyone see? So I should mention a principle that I, I, I didn't mention yet, that S, the BV differential, commutes with differentiation with respect to T. 
that's a basic. It's what's called an evolutionary vector field. This is a basic um, property of the variation of calculus. Oh, close. Not quite, because that would produce e times this, which isn't zero. But, OK, so I'll give you, uh, yeah. what if I take a derivative of e plus with respect to t? I get the derivative of this, which is minus p, p dot. But p dot is the differential of x plus. That actually wasn't too hard. of um, e plus dot minus p x plus e zero. And now we come to the next ansatz, the next part of Batan and Wilkowski's ansatz. And incidentally, uh, so I have a paper on the archive about this, and it refers to all the literature that you'll need, and uh, in particular a paper of Felder and Kashdan, which placed this ansatz at the center of their discussion. The ansatz is, we have a cohomology class in ghost number negative one. And we have to kill it. We don't want cohomology in negative degree. It shouldn't be there. Yeah? That principle may or may not be a good one, but I'm going to adopt it. And so let's introduce a new field of ghost number negative 2 whose differential is going to be this. And I'll call that for whatever reason. So we've got more fields, E and uh, E plus. And now I'm going to introduce a new field, C with ghost number 1 and C plus with ghost number negative 2. Notice 0 plus negative 1 is negative 1, and 1 plus negative 2 is negative 1. And so you know, we're adding extra terms to the symplectic form. And I want S of C plus to equal this expression. How can I do that? I need to modify S so that S anti bracket C plus is equal to this. Yes. Do you mind doing that exercise for me? Oh, sorry. When I do S of that thing, I'm not going to Let me show you. Okay. So S of DE plus by DT equals D by DT of S of E plus which is d by dt of minus a half p squared, which is minus p times p dot, which is minus p times s of x plus, which is minus s of p x plus. That's a step I don't say. s of p is 0 because p plus doesn't occur anywhere. The canonically conjugate variable to p, how could, how could s of p be anything? Non-zero. But it was x dot. P has ghost number zero. I thought, I thought S of P was supposed to be. S of P plus. S of P plus is this. S of P. Stuff of ghost number zero is close to zero. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. S of P has ghost number zero. S of P has ghost number one. And there's nothing yet. I haven't introduced any fields of ghost number non uh, positive. So. A fortiori, S of P is zero. There's no problem. Thank you. For the moment, it's about to change. Uh, no, it isn't actually. S of P will always be zero. Um, but was it clear that this was the only cocycle that? It isn't clear, work? but you can prove it. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, the only up to cohomology. Yeah yeah. 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 You can prove that actually. And once we kill this, actually, there's no negative. So Felder and Kashdans or Bahamabilkiewski's ansatz holes in this setting.
So in order to implement this, we need to add another piece to the that's the new term in the action. And it still satisfies S anti-bracket S is zero. But now it implements this. And it actually corrects S of P plus actually changes uh, by the addition of X plus C. So you get a, you know you get some changes. And now S of X and S of S of X is non-zero, it's actually minus PC. S of P is still zero, and S of E is minus C dot. C, sorry, yeah, minus C dot. Yeah. So you get some changes. And S squared is still zero, and now there are no negative degree classes. Okay. And you can calculate the homology, and I think it's all in degree zero. But that's your mu symmetry, the C is the mu symmetry. Yeah. See, there's only cohomology in degree zero now. Um, I think that's right. Maybe there's, no, maybe there's cohomology in degree one as well. Uh, and uh, actually, there's a caveat in what I just said. There's two, yeah, OK. Uh, there's, there's more cohomology, I'm sorry. But it's, uh, I'll come to that later in the talk. So I'm talking roughly about half of the cohomology at the moment, but I'll talk about the other half uh, a little while, in a little while. Is that okay? Okay, so that's the introduction. And now I want to implement all of that for this theory. And so that's, most of that work has been done. And uh, let me take, let me do it over here because it deserves lots of room. So the answer is going to look awfully complicated. Could, could you take a minute and just summarize again without the formulas? What's the principle? The principle is if there are after introducing the Cossel complex for the Euler Lagrange equations, well there are two principles. One is that the differential comes from an anti-bracket, this Poisson bracket. Of the Batanovukovsky symplectic structure. On the field space. On the fields and anti field space. It's a shifted cotangent bundle. Okay? It's um, T star 1 of. No, minus, minus 1. Thank you. <laughs> you definitely know the. Yeah, of field space. So that's the first principle, that, it's a, that the differential is going to be given by a Poisson bracket, and that we take the cost, and we want no negative degree cohomology, up to the caveat, which I hope to get to at the very end. And the second part of the principle is that the positive degree oh. co-cycles give you symmetry. That's right. Although that's. That's just interpretation. Well, it's, it, well yeah. but it, it yeah. is the interpretation you the correct that interpretation. motivated you. It's the correct interpretation. You recover somehow in the positive degrees. If you get rid of the anti-fields, you're left with the BRS complex. For those of you who know what that is, it's roughly the algebra cohomology for the symmetries of the theory that you want to gauge. Yeah. So I'm going to take x dot minus a half theta theta dot. Uh, question. Oh, oh sorry. So by causal complex, you just need to shift to the contagion bundle. Mm, I guess so. Yeah. But it has more structure here because it's a cotangent bundle. So it has the symplectic form. That was the discovery, I guess. Well, one of the many discoveries of Batana's book. Uh, but somehow you are like modifying this uh, structure on this connection. I'm not modifying this. Yeah. 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 Stay, that stays the same. We don't touch it. But did you 
had more types? I had more fields. I expanded the field space. It was a new manifold. Oh. That's okay. right. Actually, I said I guess Batana would exist. Where, where on earth did they get this idea? from. One thing that um, someone pointed out to me is that they might have been a bit influenced by uh, some work of Albert Schwarz, but I don't know the full. He was studying analytic torsion um, for, uh, on three manifolds for what that's worth. Anyway, so we have this, and then we had minus a half BEP squared, and to get supersymmetry I'm going to need a new field, which is still a one form, so we have E D T, which is a bosonic one form, and uh, it's uh, the graviton. And now we're going to have psi D T. This is a fermionic one form, the gravitino. That's just a joke in physics. To whenever you have a particle. So like new, new, uh, work, neutron neutrino. It should be electron electrino, but it isn't. Yeah. So and these, remember, these have ghost number zero. They're just fields. They're they're fields in the theory. They don't have any dynamical content. They don't have. Uh, they're not. An e note to boson. Bosino. No, no. Otherwise, otherwise, you put an s in the beginning. Selector. Oh, that! Yes, that's true. Scraviton. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Sposon. Okay. So, um, it turns out that the correct additional term is that. And then, again, we integrate to get the action. And this now is the initial piece, this corresponds to the, the first line. But uh, I'm now going to have to guess the remaining terms. I'll just write them out because I'll, I would be here forever if I was trying to derive them. Okay, I didn't bring my notes, so I might have it wrong. Let's see if I can get it right. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no. Um, no dots. Oh, I forget what it was. Um, the anti-field of the graviton, yeah? Um, two times psi plus gamma plus um, C, uh, gamma squared C plus something like that. So the algorithm is, in this case, there are more fields, and so there are more ways of making cohomology classes, cocycles in degree negative one. And you find there are two independent cocycles in degree negative one, modulo co-boundaries. And here they are. This one somehow corresponds to the diffeomorphism group of the real line, and this one somehow corresponds to supersymmetry. In the sense that the fields that we're adding in order to incorporate them into the action are ghosts, so-called, for those symmetries. So C is the ghost for reparameterization, and gamma is the ghost for supersymmetry, local supersymmetry. This is the simplest supergravity theory that you will ever see in your life. Okay? Unfortunately, it's really quite simple to establish that S bracket S is zero. And I discovered it's already not so boring to get rid of all the matter fields. That removes the first. Uh, it removes the first line entirely, 
it removes this term, and it removes these two terms, and you're left with a very simple model, but which has quite complicated cohomology. And that's the point of my talk now. If we wanted to continue this story to more negative ghost numbers, I would ask, well, what about in lower degree ghost numbers, do I have now non trivial co-cycles that I should be killing? And then, when I kill them, I have new fields, and maybe I get more ghost, more cohomology classes that have to be killed. And it could be a never-ending story. And I'm going to show you that, alarmingly, there are cohomology classes in every single negative degree, but I don't think they're the kind of cohomology classes that I want to kill. So somehow, if we adopt the BV formalism, then something a bit surprising happens. There's cohomology in all negative degrees, which doesn't violate any hypotheses in mathematics, but it does seem to go a little against the grain of what physicists were suggesting was the case. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. One way of saying this might be that supermanifolds are never uh, somehow uh, regular in the sense of uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, Tony, do you have a... No, no, I don't think it's that. Um... I mean, it, it's something, in fact, something similar happened in, in, in felder Karsdan, right? Because um, I, I think it's this issue of, of um, whether the field space is uh, a finite type mm -hmm. or whether it's almost a finite type. Ah, well, that's the words that one uses. So, so almost so finite type, meaning that it. Yeah, but they, they're a very interesting paper because they, the best example they were able to point to, which violated in field theory the condition that there were no negative degree classes, they pointed to a paper of Mignov. But Mignov's classes are only, they're somehow ghost number zero co-cycles that are then descended the same, to yeah. very, to dimensions down to the dimension of the manifold. Uh, in this case, one. So I'm going to come to those classes. They'll be here. But these, these classes are a very different type. And as far as I know, this is the first field theory where anybody actually found classes going down to negative infinity. No, but I, I'm saying it's not, not true? it's not unexpected that they should be Oh, it's, there. Not, it's not unexpected. And I, I think the people who actually uh, uh, think about uh, yeah, so I had a, a, a long conversation with Nick Rosenblum about that. Uh, yes. And he claims that we should be doing AKSZ already for, you know, not even stacks, but just pre stacks Oh, well, that, that could be. And, but that's and, a difference. But he didn't have any example yes. uh, uh, of yes. when it happened. Well, that so, might be so the maybe that, that might be the solution, because this is an AKSZ model itself. Uh, it's probably just, you may be the only person in the room who knows what AKSZ is. Right, but meaning. Uh, so let me just say, you, this is an AKSZ model. If, what does AKSZ mean? AKSZ, listen to me. I'm yeah. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the fields are not functions or uh, sections of vector bundles. They're actually differential forms on the real line. That's what. Roughly speaking, that's what AKS Z says. So in our case, the fields will be X plus P plus um, P plus X plus. Because it turns out that P plus and X plus are naturally one forms. Theta plus theta plus. And then where actually for, for these I have to use the, um, for these I don't have to do anything, for this I have to use the Minkowski uh, inner product to convert this from a tangent to a cotangent vector to add it to this, but, uh, and then I get C plus E, gamma plus psi, and then the corresponding anti-fields. 
So maybe that's an, a possible direction for an answer to this issue. It's possible that I only have a finite number of A, K, and C fields, and I need an infinite number. Maybe I should be directly resolving in this language. I don't know. So what you see is all the fields pair up, and then you can now recombine. So let me give an uh, example. If I take p times the x dot, and um, no, that one actually just gives only that term. But this e p squared, um, it'll have another piece where we'll have uh, c times p plus, and that's this term. So these two terms are actually one term in the AKSC formalism. This was pointed out to me by uh, Mignoff. To give another example, this term is actually associated with um, uh, gamma, um, gamma x plus theta with this term and with gamma theta plus p with this term. So these three terms are one term in the AKSC what model. Are you doing? I'm sorry? What are you doing? I'm rewriting the original action in terms of these inhomogeneous forms. It turns out that there's a secret way to combine all of these many fields into half the number of fields, as long as I think of them not as zero or one forms on the world line R, but as inhomogeneous forms. And when I do that, everything combines very neatly and I, uh, the action becomes much simpler to write down. So, I just couldn't do, you to, how, 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 do you want me to finish? I can finish this, actually. It's, this is an interesting... No, no, I just don't understand how, how the things so called are related. By, so for example, this term, what I'm writing here is um, gamma plus psi times p plus x plus times theta plus theta plus, and then extract the one form so I can integrate. Zero form, one form, zero form, one form, zero form, one form. So I get three terms. And those are these three terms. So suddenly the action begins to make more sense. So this was pointed out to be my pointed out to me by Mignon. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe that's okay, good. So uh, where to so maybe I'll try to write the method of constructing the cohomology classes, the bad cohomology classes for you. But Mm -hmm. Okay, so you identify these bad homology classes. You still probably need to absorb them by some higher symmetries on the other side. I, I cannot. To. You'll see how stupid the co-cycle formulas are. Okay, and so I've actually proved a theorem, you know, spectral sequence type uh, proof, calculating the cohomology of the differential for this model. Okay, it's feasible. It turns out it's not. It's not completely. It helps. Okay, so using the spectral sequence, I can't prove directly the spectral sequence collapses at E3, but it does. And the reason I know that is because I can write down lifts of all of the terms in E3 of the spectral sequence up to the original uh, complex. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. I'll leave the spectral sequence out. By the way though, in retrospect, I would have been able to guess these formulas because the, the filtration in the spectral sequence exactly respects these pairings. And so I was so amused after thinking about it. It was so obvious. But where is the spectral sequence coming from? I want to filter uh -huh. the whole complex for the BV differential. By what? By some, I write down a crazy filtration. But it's, it's not dictated by a combination of Gauss numbers and no, parities. No, it's no, it's random. It's a difference. It's, completely it's well, an ad hoc filtration. It's pretty ad hoc. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the result of staring at it for a week. And then I find one. And then, of course, I'm embarrassed enough to find there was one choice 
which had the advantage that it's an entirely infiltration degree positive. So that means that you know that the spectral sequence converges. Whereas the, for the other filtrations, it's not obvious that the spectral sequence converges, but fortunately I can prove it collapses and therefore I don't need to prove it converges. I hope that that's correct. I didn't go through the logic too carefully because I've never seen a spectral sequence before that didn't converge but collapsed. So maybe, yeah. <laughs> but probably algebraic topologists need those all the time. In other words, it's one of those, you know, first and second quadrant spectral sequences. Or anyway, here's the, the most important part of the calculation is to show the cohomology classes. So I'm going to give you the negative degree cohomology classes. There are some cohomology classes in degree 0 and 1. It would take me too long to give them to you, and they're not the main point of the talk. So um, what I'm going to do is invert gamma. Now, by the end of the story, gamma will no longer need to be inverted. But as an intermediate step, I'm considering a larger class of functionals in which gamma is allowed to be inverted. Okay, It's sort of legitimate because of two reasons. Gamma is a boson. It has ghost number negative 1. And s of gamma is 0. So it's particularly easy to calculate differentials even when gamma is localized. Because then, of course, s of gamma inverse is also 0. So I'm going to take some complicated function of all the fields and form S of it. And suppose that this is in my field, in my algebra of functionals. i.e. gamma only occurs with non-negative powers. So I took the differential of something with gamma inverse in it, but I'm saying suppose that by some great luck, S of this doesn't have gamma inverse in it. Then, this is automatically a co-cycle, but it's extremely unlikely that it's a co-boundary. You can check that it, in practice, the examples I write down, they're definitely not co-boundaries. So this is a, does anybody know another place in algebra where one generates co-cycles by that technique? You look at co-boundaries in a larger complex, and if they happen to be in the smaller complex, they're co-cycles. This must be a very common method. But my last grad student used it in his thesis, and I'd never seen it before. <laughs> so I was amused when I started using it myself. Um, OK. So now, you know, you basically spend a few weeks staring at um, A4 paper, and eventually you come up with the following that um, you take an arbitrary function of x and you multiply it by c and by <coughs> psi plus to the k uh, plus uh, 2, no, plus 1, times gamma inverse. And this is exactly of the type that I said. It's, it's a functional except that it has one power of gamma inverse. And now I take S of this, and that's really quite complicated. But, ah, sorry, uh, this is, the formula's wrong. Times theta 1 up to theta p. So I've done the Because this has every possible, all d of the theta fields in it, certain terms that would otherwise upset the story uh, automatically uh, disappear because theta mu squared is zero. It's a fermion. Okay, so it's some kind of Poincaré lemma or something. Sorry, I thought we were in dimensional one. Yes. No, so but the D? target space. The target space. Oh, the target. D is the dimension of the target space. Yeah. So I have D 
Fisa fields. The target I'm place is a super yeah. manifold right. I'm just multiplying the DD. Yeah. Or whatever. It turns out that this and works. It. This is a cohomology class. So this is in H minus K. And it's non zero. For every F, for every function of X. So that's a lot of. A lot of okay. And there's another which is similar but more complicated to write. So there's a pair of such classes. And finally, each of these classes gives rise to another class in degree one less. It's a kind of uh, de descent procedure that people who study Yang Mills know very well. But here, I may forget the formula, but suppose, ah, I should say that the correct formula is this. This is the cohomology class. I, I wrote a density, I have to integrate it. All right? And uh, suppose that um, A is a, a, a K cocycle. Then, then G A is a ZK minus one per cycle. So how does that work? And what's G? So here's the formula for G. Let's do a quick count. The ghost number went down by one, therefore G has to have ghost number negative two. And G is given by all, I won't get the signs right, but let me just Now I should have had my notes. Um, okay, C plus times E plus Psi uh, times gamma plus. Okay, and the signs are systematically incorrect here, but it's roughly right. So if I take this expression, and this expression is actually determined by the fact that when I wrote out those AKSZ fields, the one form component is always G bracket the zero form component. So that's what characterizes this expression. And then you automatically get this. The reason is that G bracket A is a total derivative, and therefore when you integrate it, you get zero. So that's the other half of the classes. I wanted to mention those. In my first draft of the paper, the, now I call the version, in version one on the archive, I should say, I forgot, I didn't notice these guys at all. And so the paper's completely wrong. And then somebody emailed me and pointed out that there should be some more classes, and then I discovered them. So. Also, the first version of the paper is amusing. Because I didn't know about G, I actually was constructing these classes by hand. So, no, actually, I'm sorry. In the first version of the paper, I actually did have these classes. But I constructed them by hand using um, yeah, so there's a spreadsheet, actually, which lasts three pages at the back of the paper, in which I do the whole calculation. It's completely insane. But, um, but it's much easier to just write the, this formula. Yeah. OK, I, that's, that's uh, everything I have to tell you today. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, but I don't need them. Yeah, for these negative degree cohomology class, actually, for none of the cohomology classes, do derivatives enter. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty special property, I guess. Of this I mean, that's partially because we're working with a first order theory, and you know, there's a lot to be said for working only with first order. Theories. So by first order, I mean every term in the action has at most one partial derivative with respect to any of the space, the world sheet variables. Um, 
Because that, I think, roughly means then that you've replaced any derivatives that would occur in the expressions for cohomology classes by these auxiliary fields. It certainly can happen that special sequences collapse without the conversion. Okay, good. So, well, I hope so, because I have one. Yeah. Oh. You have one that collapses and you... But I converge in the sense I have no reason to think it converges. It... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, I mean, essentially, I'm only using the spectral sequence to get a... What's the word? A lower bound on the cohomology, and then I, I show it's also an upper bound. Or if I got it exactly the wrong way around. This is why I don't want this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit the last part. Yeah. <laughs> you also ask, so I, it's, I see that you have the right thing here, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's stackiness. Maybe I'm. Oh, well, the stackiness is because um, you've got the ghosts, so there's a Lie algebra. Mm. You see, C and gamma you can think of as coordinates for. Uh, a Lie algebra. For the stabilizers. Yeah. yeah. So C, uh, there's a very interesting story here because C and gamma don't, C for example, so to understand the variation induced by C, we take the differential and we extract all the coefficients of C. And what you see is that um, it takes x to theta and theta to P. Now this doesn't look particularly like the usual supersymmetry, but if you impose the euler lagrange equation, it becomes the usual supersymmetry. P is uh, uh, x dot. Yeah. So it, it's, it's hiding the supersymmetry. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, this is gamma. Yeah. And now if you, the very, the this is a bit annoying. You wonder what's going on here. The point is that, um, again, P dot is an Euler Lagrange equation. So you can set, you can put P dot here just by modifying the right hand side by something which vanishes on shell. So on shell, this is general covariance and local supersymmetry. Off shell, it's more complicated, but it doesn't matter because that's the whole point of BRS and BV, that as long as the square of the differential is zero, you don't really want to start trying to work out how to separate different symmetries from each other. They're all bound in together uh, in, in homotopical algebra. More questions? Let's thank you again.